Welcome everyone. The ICMA Learning Lab is pleased to present this online education program, Thriving Communities, Federal Funding for Advancing Economic Mobility and Resilient Communities, brought to you by the ICMA Research and Policy Team in Sustainable Strategies DC. For technical assistance, please email learning at icma.org. Today's presentation will last up to 90 minutes and includes a question and answer opportunity. So please submit your questions at any time throughout the presentation using the Q&A panel at the bottom of the screen. During Q&A, our presenters will answer as many questions as time allows. It is my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Laura Gadiris, Director of Research for ICMA. Laura, welcome to the program. Thanks, Julian. So as Julian mentioned, um, I'm Laura Gadiris. I'm ICMA's Director of Research. And over the past year, I've had the privilege of working with a very inspiring collection of other ICMA staff, of our members and their local government staffs and um, other partners in, um, in collaborating on activities and programming around boosting upward economic mobility in communities. And I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the generous support of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, of these efforts. And also, just a quick plug, you can find more out more about the work that we've been doing over the last year, as well as um, keep tabs on future education and training opportunities you may be able to participate in by visiting icma.org slash EMO. But obviously, one of the challenges and questions that comes up in thinking about what can be advanced at the local level to boost upward economic mobility and greater opportunities for residents is how to fund or otherwise support new projects, new programs, and activities. And meanwhile, we know we are still in this period of tremendous investment via what we like to call complementary movements. So whether you frame them as thriving communities, environmental justice, community redevelopment, or something else, I think you'll hear some of those terms today, um, you know, in, in part driven by that focus on economic mobility, and also because we know that there is a lot of general interest in keeping up with what's available at the federal level and and other levels, we really wanted to bring you this webinar and we're very excited to partner with Sustainable Strategies on this. Um, this is a firm that many of you may know we frequently turn to for this sort of content, given their expertise in what we like to refer to as resource road mapping. Um, so making sense out of a complex landscape of funding and technical assistance opportunities. So I'm pleased to welcome Matt Ward and Sarah Marin to the program. Matt co-founded Sustainable Strategies and has been a frequent virtual and in-person presenter at ICMA events. And so in addition to being DC insiders, he and Sarah together have a great deal of experience working with local communities in pursuing and capturing the types of resources that they will talk about today. So I encourage you all to think about questions and share those uh, via the Q&A pod as we go along and we'll keep an eye on those, but we'll generally, generally plan to address them uh, at the end. And given the volume of interest in today's program, we may not be able to address everything live today, but Matt and Sarah have graciously offered to try and address outstanding priority questions in a follow-up message. So um, you will also, uh, before that question comes through, you'll also be able to access slides from today's presentation via the Learning Lab platform. So with that, I will hand it over to our dynamic duo of experts to kick things off. So again, welcome to you all, and especially Sarah and Matt. Thank you, Laura, and hello, everybody across the nation and beyond. It's uh, good to be with uh, our friends from ICMA. I've been able to work with ICMA since the mid-90s. They're one of the most effective organizations in Washington. They understand what thriving communities are about and how to help you um, get the tools and resources to be able to make it happen. So, it's good to be here. Uh, again, I'm Matt Ward. I'm the CEO of a firm called Sustainable Strategies DC, and we help communities get resources for revitalization. We're really glad to be uh, here with you. I'm glad that my colleague Sarah Marin, a senior associate here and a, and a colleague who really knows this topic, uh, took the lead in putting together this presentation. And uh, she, she and I are going to tag team back and forth to do it. So why don't uh, we kick right in with the agenda? We'll tell you what we're going to try to get done over the next 75 minutes or so uh, before we open it up for Q&A. So number one. Yep. Okay, so we're talking about thriving communities and economic mobility of the people 
uh, in those communities. So, so what are we talking about? What is a thriving community, and 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 how do thriving communities support economic mobility and opportunity? The second thing we're going to get into is we're just going to give you an overview of the federal funding landscape, um, which is unlike anything we've seen. Uh, this is my thirtieth year of pursuing resources for localities, and it is um, a tremendous opportunity right now with uh, more resources than we've ever seen. Um, next, we're going to talk about what are the uh, the um, the main routes to getting funding. People hear about the Inflation Reduction Act and people hear about the bipartisan infrastructure law. You hear about earmarking. Um, we're going to talk about the kind of main vehicles and approaches to finding federal and other sources of funding. Then we're going to turn to some specific funding opportunities. We've got a lot of them in this presentation, more than we're going to be able to handle in an in-depth way. Every bullet on these slides of upcoming funding opportunities could be a 90-minute webinar on its own. So we're going to look wide rather than deep, but we are going to tell you how you can get further sources of information about those funding sources, both from the uh, the, the the funders and from ICMA, which is an expert in technical assistance on those matters, from us and from others. And so we're going to talk about those. I do want to just note quickly that we're focusing mostly on um, community revitalization, economic revitalization, infrastructure, uh, sustainable redevelopment, uh, resilience, and topics like that. There's a whole field of what I would term more in the um, the health and human services fields. Well, we will touch on some of those. There's a whole in-depth world that would focus more on uh, health, wellness, mental health and wellness, substance use disorder. And we're not going to focus on those kind of health and human services or education grant funding as well. That's for another webinar. Okay. After we talk about some of these funding opportunities, we're going to talk about after you, uh, after you get a look at all of these sources of funding that are available now and will be for the coming handful of years, how do you organize your city or county or town to be effective in going after these resources. So we're going to tell you our best tips of the trade for organizing effectively for resource advocacy. After that, um, we're going to just give you one case study, um, a community where we've done work for probably 10 years, Norfolk, Virginia, and a particular area of the community that I think is a wonderful illustration of about, of about what economic mobility an opportunity can be about and how the right kind of funding can help you get there. And then finally, we'll do some Q&A. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, just, uh, you know, thriving community is what we all want to be. I mean, uh, for a municipal manager, that's essentially your job. How do you make your community thrive more economically in terms of equity and inclusion, in terms of sustainability, in terms of uh, all the values that are important to your local community. And we could talk all day about that, but I will tell you that the the, the theme thriving communities is the theme of the current uh, Biden administration. A lot of their funding sources are organized around the idea of thriving communities and what it means. And you can see the graphic on the right. Those are, you know, coming on a dozen federal agencies that are part of a federal interagency thriving communities network that they're trying to take a whole of government approach to be able to integrate sources of funding assistance and and uh, and policy to help you cities and towns and counties be able to access this funding and so um I'm not going to uh read the whole slide but you can see that you know elements of a thriving community is that the community is engaged it has a built environment that supports healthy, diverse, vibrant, prosperous uh, communities um, that um, are uh, removing barriers and creating access for economic mobility, building community wealth in other ways. And again, I'll just say that um, there are federal agencies that have used the, the theme of thriving communities to try to channel their funding into making cities and towns and counties better. Okay, on the next slide, Laura, 
talked about how uh, ICMA has got an entire initiative about economic mobility, and they're they're uh, putting forth tools and resources and ideas about that in a lot of ways. And this is a graphic um, uh, that is uh, used frequently by ICMA and its partners to talk about what economic mobility is. I mean, we know that there are social determinants of poverty and there are social determinants of poor health and there are conditions of neighborhoods that make it very difficult to access work or healthy foods or education or safety or access to nature, parks and open space. You could go on and on and, you know, being... Um, being uh, faced with barriers and limitations on your ability to access those things, it's going to be difficult for you to be a thriving person or family um, or neighborhood or sometimes an entire community. I mean, I've worked with communities. I mean, I, I worked very closely with Flint and their water crisis. And just, you know, there were so many barriers to mo economic mobility there that, um, you know, what a struggle. And so to be able to uh, take the power and autonomy of people and communities um, in an inclusive way where everybody and every every uh, every member of the community is given dignity and belonging to reach eco economic success, uh, that's uh, upward mobility from poverty. And then along the graphics at the bottom, you can see pillars of education, good work, uh, a responsive government, inclusive neighborhoods that uh, enable people to do this. So we're going to try to talk about, and we're not just doing it to fit a theme that ICMA would like to, you know, squeeze uh, these federal resources into. This framework is guiding funding from the Biden administration, from philanthropy, and from many states. And so uh, if you're not serious about thriving communities and economic mobility, you're going to be at a very serious competitive disadvantage for securing these big grants. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, Sarah, I think we're turning over to you. Uh, all you, Sarah. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. So along the same lines of the first slide with thriving communities and economic mobility, we know that thriving communities foster an environment that support economic mobility. They provide community members with the tools to have that upward economic mobility. So on that first slide, we showed you the, the landscape of the agencies that are participating in this intergovernmental thriving communities network. So this network was created knowing that there's so much money flowing down from the top, but communities oftentimes do not have the capacity, either the financial capacity or the technical expertise or any number of different capacity elements to do this work on their own to get a hold of those huge amounts of funny flowing money flowing down. So under this framework, this interagency framework, one of the agencies is the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and they have what are called Tic Tacs or Thriving Communities Technical Assistance Centers. So we are lucky enough that ICMA is actually one of these Tic Tacs. So ICMA covers the, the national region as well as EPA region eight. And you can see which communities are, which states are covered under region eight. But they offer a number of different sources or types of technical assistance to really make sure communities like yours are ready and able to chase this huge amount of funding and other sources that are flowing down to communities to really help you get to that vision of what you believe your community will look like in order to be a thriving community. So there's peer-to-peer -peer technical assistance, coaching on the ground and virtual support, similar to what we're doing right now, assistance with the actual funding program. So not only grant writing assistance, but understanding the administrative requirements uh, around those federal grants, which can be hard for communities who might not have dabbled in the federal grant sphere before. Um, the different portals that are used or needed to be set up to access these funds, and then other types of tools and databases similar to this webinar with upcoming funding opportunities, tools for success, clearinghouses with information to support you all. So 
ICMA is one of these Tic Tacs, so you can reach out to them if you would like some more of this type of assistance, but we just wanted to lay it out for you um, on this slide. So, sorry, I'm, I'm dual rolling here. I'm doing the slides and also presenting. So what Matt had touched on earlier is that the federal funding landscape looks a little different now than it might have five, 10 years ago. Um, in that the Biden administration has really set up parameters and support systems to move the needle on specific issues. And what we found, sorry, let me do this one, um, is the whole of government approach that the Biden administration is taking. So think about that picture we showed with the different agencies. He is making sure that all of these agencies are rowing the boat in the same direction. They want to make sure that there is a consistency around the priorities across all of these different funding programs, across all of these different funding agencies. So the real focus is that there's three areas or buckets to consider are disadvantaged communities, sustainability, and job creation and infrastructure development. And I'm gonna go through those first and then we'll go to that second bullet listed at the top. So the first one to note is the Justice 40 initiative. So the Biden administration set up the Justice 40 initiative which is a goal that 40% of these federal investments are flowing directly to disadvantaged communities. So there's a little graphic there and it's kind of hard to see, but they have laid out parameters around what it means to be a disadvantaged community. And you, you can be disadvantaged in a number of different ways. So it could be historically disinvested. It could be levels of poverty, it could be access. There's a number of different ways to measure this, which we'll go into shortly. But the Justice 40 initiative is really pushing to make sure these funds are getting where they're needed. Then we have environmental sustainability. So across all of these funding programs, we see a push for improved environmental sustainability and reductions of greenhouse gases and other pollutants. So projects that are able to touch on both of these things are great. Then the last one is investing in America. So with the huge amount of federal investment that's coming down, they're really trying to invest in American infrastructure. But on the flip side of that, make sure that the people who are being put to work, the businesses that are supporting that infrastructure development or the people supporting that infrastructure development are here in the U.S. and they are good jobs that are being supported with all of this money. So within these three kind of, I'm just going to call them really general pillars of Biden's whole of government approach, he has, not he, the administration has set up systems to help make sure this is possible. So as part of Justice 40, many of these fu federal funding programs have either waivers or flexible match requirements. So if your project is taking place in a place that they identify as disadvantaged, then you will frequently either have your match completely waived or reduced to help make it easier for you to access these funds. Similarly, with the EPA Tic Tacs and the other technical assistance, thriving communities, technical assistance programs, they're really trying to boost capacity to chase these funds, boost capacity more generally, make sure funds are going where they're intended to go. And then lastly, under this kind of investing in America framework, the Biden administration has created, it's called the Build America Buy America Act. So it's the idea that not only are the jobs here in the United States, but the things that are being put in place, so the materials used, are also being manufactured here in the United States. So a lot of these federal programs, and you might see it listed in some of the announcements, it's called BABA or Build America, Buy America Act. There are frameworks set in place to make sure that these pillars are actually working. So it, this whole of government approach is kind of new for us, but it is helpful as a framework to understand all of these different funding programs we're gonna talk about shortly, and then the framework of the types of projects that the administration is looking to fund. All right, and I think this is me, okay. So how do you know if you're a disadvantaged community or how do you know about your environmental sustainability levels or different things like that? The great thing is there are a number of tools out there to help you understand your community more specifically as it fits into these broader themes. So the first one, we see this a lot um, with a lot of the different agencies use this first tool. So it's called the Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool. Um, 
and you can go in, type in an address, and it'll tell you whether or not it's considered disadvantaged under the framework that they've laid out with these eight different categories or indicators that they have set up. So that's just one example. So the DOT raise grants, which are out now on the street, they use this framework to help determine if a community or where the project will be located is a disadvantaged community, which then would qualify you to have your match waived different things like that. The EPA IRA Disadvantaged Communities Tool and IRA stands for Inflation Reduction Act is a similar tool like the CEJST screen. They have they all have acronyms, so I apologize. Um, it's just another tool to help you understand your community's landscape. Maybe you, you look at this before starting a project and you see, okay, these neighborhoods are the ones that the, the administration has identified as disadvantaged. What projects or programs can we put in those areas that those are the areas they're looking to invest in? So it's helpful not only in, in the actual grant writing process, but identifying your priority projects. Then old tried and true, we have data.census.gov. This is the U.S. Census Bureau's website or portal to access all that census data that they gather every year. They have estimates updated annually, and then as we know, they have the big census push every five years to get as accurate information as possible. So there's a treasure trove of information and data there to support the story you're trying to tell and also see how you align with those big Biden administration priorities. And then lastly, again, all these do similar things. There is the CDC Social Vulnerability Index. So you'll plug in, it's either census tract or county, um, and it will pump out a number, usually up to one, um, so it's a, a decimal point, that will tell you what level of social uh, vulnerability that community is facing. So if you have a high social vulnerability, that would look like a 0.9 SVI metric. Uh, a low social vulnerability would be 0.1. And they have, again, a number of different measurements that they use to come up with these numbers. But we see time and time again that agencies either use these as qualifications for matching or want to see you highlighting this information throughout your narrative or the applications you're submitting. They want to understand the full story behind your community. And this data can kind of help you shape that and mold that into the story you're looking for. So okay, I think this was, the next one is going to be the last one for me. Um, so Matt touched on this. There are a number of different routes to funding. So it's not just one and done. There are a number of different types of sources of funding. So we've laid out a few here. These are the big ones that we want you to just stay aware of. So the first is just annual federal agency funding. So every year, the federal government has to pass a new budget. It's called the Appropriations Act. And within that, there is usually... I know it's going to say usually because the numbers change every year, but approximately $700 billion of that annual funding goes towards non-defense discretionary spending. That includes all of these grant programs that we see all of the time. So year over year, these are programs that we'll see. Sometimes they create new programs in the legislation, but this is one of the main sources of funding that we'll see a lot of these federal grant programs funded through. Within that framework, within the appropriations legislation or annual federal funding, there is a new mechanism, well, a new old mechanism um, called earmarks. They are now calling them congressionally directed funding or community funding requests. They have different names. Um, but as part of the framework for overall federal funding, they have pulled out some of those funds and are now allowing members of Congress to identify specific projects, so not just the programs or the level of funding they wanna see, but specific projects within their jurisdiction or their areas um, that they can target for funding. So then it's a line item within the larger piece of legislation rather than you having to go on the back end once the legislation is passed, uh, submit an application, go through the review process with that specific agency that is funded under and get funding through that new mechanism. So there's a lot of different interesting, they call them accounts, they're not grant programs, but accounts that cover a whole number of different 
areas of lo local community priorities from healthcare, transportation, parks, uh, cops, or uh, public safety. They have a whole number of different accounts available through this route of funding. Um, the next ones, which are kind of what we were talking about when we say there's a huge, huge amount of funding flowing down, it's these next two categories. So the first is the bipartisan infrastructure law. This authorized $1.2 trillion for transportation and infrastructure spending with a little under half of that for new investments or new grant programs. So to keep that in perspective, the legislation that's pending now for fiscal year 2024 or the federal spending, spending legislation set at 1.66 trillion. And this bill had 1.2 trillion in it. So almost an entire year's worth of federal funding has been plugged in for grant projects like the ones your communities are interested in. So huge, huge portions of funding are now flowing down to communities for these transportation and infrastructure, and infrastructure type projects. Along the same lines, we also have the Inflation Reduction Act, which similar to the bipartisan infrastructure law, these are targeted funds. Um, they The mechanisms here are a little different. Some of them are incentives such as tax incentives. Some of them are grants and some of them are loan programs to support new infrastructure focused mostly on clean energy, transportation, and the environment. Environmental sustainability like that pillar we talked about under the funding landscape. The next category of funding we have, which often gets overlooked, is state funding. So similar to the federal government, the state governments also pass their appropriation, what they don't call them appropriations, they're spending every year and have their own grant program set up to support localities like yours. Um, and the great thing about these is there are different buckets of funding in that when you have to look at your matches, state funding and federal funding fall into different buckets. So we, it's important to think about the entire landscape of opportunities and using them interchangeably together, built on top of each other. Um, just make sure you're, you're looking at all avenues. And then the last uh, category is philanthropy or nonprofits or charities, different organizations of this type. Now they do tend to be smaller grants, smaller sources of funding, but still really important sources there. A lot of these type of philanthropic funds can get you at least going on a project. So they might be more interested in funding pilots or doing the technical assistance, the planning phases of these work to get you geared up for these maybe larger sources of funding. All right, and then with that, Matt, I'm gonna switch it over to you. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, so we are about to launch into dozens and dozens of funding sources, and we're not gonna be able to spend a lot of time on them. So we wanted to tell you some good places you could go. Uh, you know, you're gonna get these slides from ICMA, or you might wanna take a screenshot with your phone, because these are the places that we go and that you can go to to be able to find out much more about these grants. So if you could start rolling these bullets out, um, Sarah, you know, grants.gov is a uh, is the system that manages all the federal grants. Uh, it's kind of a pain in the neck, but uh, there are a lot of information. You go to what's called a NOFO, a Notice of Funding Opportunity. Sometimes they call them NOFA, Notice of Funding Announcement, or a RFA, uh, Request for Applications. Those are going to have the grant program with the details of what you have to submit, how you'll be evaluated, and how the program works. When we want to learn about a fund, we read the NOFOs, and you get those off grants.gov. You can also get them from the agency. Uh, Sarah and I and our whole office, is, uh, we're on many agency listservs, newsletters. You can go on their web pages as well, but we get a notice when a new grant is coming out of um, – of HUD or the Economic Development Administration or the Appalachian Regional Commission. You can get on those as well. Now, uh, I've worked since the 90s with ICMA on brownfields. ICMA is one of the leading organizations on brownfields. This is not a webinar about brownfields, but that guide, the 2023 Brownfields Federal Program Guide, has over 80 sources of grants, loans, and tax incentives for community revitalization. It goes well beyond EPA 
cleanup of contamination. Every program that really matters to uh, economic um, uh, revitalization is in that guidebook. I strongly advise that. The White House also has a um, a bipartisan infrastructure law guide. What was it? It was about you know 400 pages. We wow. read it when it came out. Um, uh, it cured our insomnia, but we uh, we often go to that to see what the shape and size of the of the bipartisan law is. The um, Community Development Finance um, Association (CDFA) are like your state and local uh, funding authorities, trade association. They also have a financing toolkit. Don't let the word brownfields fool you. They go well beyond brownfields. Uh, we already talked about the Tic Tac centers. There's one also called the EPA Technical Assistance for Brownfield Centers. ICMA is one of those as well. And they uh, really help people find resources for revitalization. You can go to uh, ICMA's webinars and workshops like today. Um, we're gonna... Okay, there's a, a website called Candid. And for between $35 and $150 a month subscription, you can get access to all the foundations and really detailed information about foundations. You can tailor your searches uh, or your, uh, your, your research into those to match your geography, to match your issues, to match your size of city, to match your need for funding. And then the Council on Foundations has a web page that's for free where you can find out about community foundations in your in your town or your metropolitan area that might be ready to help, as Sarah said, provide you the planning dollars or match dollars to be able to nail some of these big uh, grants that the feds are putting out. And the last one is we have uh, uh, an email we put out once a week. We try to make it short and sweet. And it says, here are the grants that came out this week. Here are the grants that are going to be due in the coming months. And um, and then we provide links where you can get more information. Uh, that's a free email. You can go to strategiesdc.com and sign up for the spotlight. So these are the places where you find out about the grants that we're going to turn to now. So if we could turn to the next slide. Sarah put in a picture of me. Uh, uh, for this slide, we're going to talk about now that monkey doesn't seem to be moving too fast. I'm getting older, but the monkey is throwing money in the air, uh, winning grants, uh, doing projects. We're going to talk about what's coming up right now. And I warn you, it's not drinking from a fire hose. It's drinking from a waterfall. We're not going to be able to go deep into these. I'm going to go through it quickly. All right. The Department of Transportation has 42 new grant programs from between the infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and some of them that are really focused on communities like yours are the RAISE grants, $25 million grants. They're zero match in distressed areas. They're 20% matches, you know, for other places. They can be for planning. They can be for construction, for transformative transportation, surface transportation projects of all kind. Reconnecting communities and neighborhoods is essentially raise, but for undoing transportation decisions of the past that cut off areas that do not have economic mobility, a railroad embankment or a bridge embankment or a highway that cut off a black or a brown neighborhood or a poor neighborhood, and you want to undo that disconnection uh, that happened because uh, you know a whole neighborhood was cut off. Uh, $25 million grants there, or do they go up to 50? Maybe it's 25 or 50. Uh, bus and bus facilities, they're not only for buses, they're also uh, for uh, bus uh, stations and bus barns and bus um, uh, 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 infrastructure of all kinds. We've gotten lots of those for communities. There's a lot of money in it. Safe streets and roads for all, We'll give planning grants to help you come up with a safety action plan that identifies your least safe intersections, uh, the dangerous curves, the people, the places where people and pedestrians and bikes and cars are crashing and having injuries or worse. And then you can get up to $30 million to implement your safety plan after you come up with the plan. You either got to have a plan from one of their planning grants 
or your own plan that meets DOT standards. I advise you to look at that grant quickly before you get up to the implementation grant and say, oh, we don't have a plan that meets their standards. And then the TAP, the TAP program, sometimes called the Transportation Alternative Set-Asides, come down through states and MPOs for non-motorized transportation, sidewalks, trails, um, walkability, um, and, and, and other things. Very important to communities. All right, next slide. We'll talk about other DOT programs uh, that are more focused on climate and emission reductions. Uh, electric vehicles, charging and infrastructure, those were just uh, uh, put out uh, a week or uh, a little longer than a week ago. Our firm wrote the state of Connecticut. So they got $15 million uh, for deploying uh, EV uh, infrastructure. Uh, they're going to open that back up again. Cities and states and counties, uh, cities, towns and counties can apply. Protect, you see that flooded road. We have roadways that are built in the floodplains. We have bridges that are vulnerable. We have transit facilities that are subject to climatic, uh, uh, climate impacts and weather changes. If you want to armor your infrastructure, make it safer and more resilient, there's a lot of money for Protect grants. The, uh, the next one is just like the bus and bus facilities, but it's got to be for low emission or no emission, you know, electric and fuel cell and other kinds of uh, buses that are lesser polluting. Lots of money there. And then they also are doing it for ferries. Not everybody has a ferry, but those who do could get one that's not a fossil fuel ferry chugging out, um, uh, 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 you know, smoke, but it's a, it's a Tesla of ferries or something like that. All right, the next one. All right, these are large scale projects. These are not for the faint of heart. Um, you know, the mega grants, they're giving out grants of up to 500 million. You know, uh, the bridge between Cincinnati and Kentucky, Joe Biden and Mitch McConnell went and announced that grant. You know, there's one to get from Long Island into uh, New York's uh, Penn Station. It's like a billion dollar project. Um, those are tough. You're going to have to work hard on those. There are things that are smaller. Uh, Glenwood Springs, Colorado, uh, our colleague just won a $50 million grant to replace a a, a bridge that uh, would cut off that community if it failed and the bridge was failing. Infra is basically um, a raise grant for freight, trucks, ports, um, trains. You know, uh, it's more of a freight upgrade uh, bill. The bridge investment program grants, they're out now. Uh, your states have a bunch of money and the states are giving those out in a big way. Or you can compete for your own grant uh, for uh, small, medium and very large bridge investment uh, projects. And then uh, Sarah worked with Washugal, Washington, got a, what did you get, Sarah? $30 million, $40 million, $40 million grant to uh, deal with a very dangerous. Forty-one million dollar uh, grant to, uh, to to build an underpass under a railroad that was cutting that community off and causing real economic mobility and safety problems. Uh, so, so that's another one. Those are big. You better work hard on those because those are big grants. All right. Um, am I almost done here? Let's see. You got I two am more. not done yet. Okay, I got two more. Shifting from the Department of Transportation to the U.S. EPA. Uh, these are some of the, some of these are tried and true programs like the Brownfields program. Others are brand new out of the Infrastructure Inflation Reduction Act. So I'll just skip to the second one. The Brownfield grants are bigger than they've ever been. I remember when they were only getting about $60 million a year into that program. We've got billions of dollars in the EPA program now. I remember when the biggest grant you could get was $200,000. They're now giving out $5 million dollars. Brownfield cleanup grants, um, and uh, those usually open in in November and are are, are, are I'm sorry, uh, usually open in September or due in, uh, by the end of the year. Uh, Brownfield grants, same as it ever was, except a lot more money and a lot bigger. Clean school bus programs for clean or zero emission school buses. The Swiffer grants, solid waste infrastructure for municipal recycling facilities and programs. A lot of good money there coming out. The community change grants are out now. They're due by November 2024, 
but they're rolling. And I would not wait till the end of the year because they're $20 million no match grants for areas that have been impacted by environmental problems, environmental injustice, our climate um, challenged, you know, by, by the by the things that can happen with weather and climate and uh, have neighborhoods in poverty or uh, concentrated racial minorities that need funding to become more resilient, clean up brownfields, deal with green infrastructure. Those are big time grants. They're going to be highly competitive and they're open now. And the other one that is open now is climate pollution reduction grants. They're due April 1. They're not easy to do, but they can be grants of up to $500 million for everything green, like everything you can imagine, green buildings, you know, renewable energy, electric transportation, and a variety of other means. Um, there are five levels that you compete in. One is for 2 million to 10 million. And then you go up to bigger weight classes. You compete within your weight class. So if you're asking for 500 million, you better have the best program ever and a lot of work. But if you're applying for two or five or 10 million, you can you can uh, apply in that tier. Those are open now. A lot of folks are doing that. We're doing a lot of those. I would urge you to take a look at that. All right, one more slide for me on this part of the webinar uh, is a huge investment in water infrastructure. There's a giant backlog in our sewer and water infrastructure. There's a lot of money might not hit the whole backlog, but uh, for uh, drinking water, including lead pipe abatement, which is becoming a mandate by EPA, by the way. So um, you better pay attention to it. There are mandates that are in place right now. And over the next 10 plus years, uh, you know, uh, the Biden administration has set um, uh, a direction that we're going to get rid of lead pipes. There's a lot of money there. Uh, there's a lot of money in the sewer overflow and stormwater municipal grants. Those are all coming down through your states for the most part. They come through the territories as well. It's federal money, but it comes through the states. Uh, there's a lot of money for Western water. You know, the West is challenged with water. So Bureau of Reclamation projects and things like that. And then there's also these wind grants, which are um, public water systems in small underserved communities that don't really have the capacity to do big, big uh, water infrastructure projects without a lot of help. So a lot of money there. Talk to your state DEP or your state infrastructure authority. And I think I'm turning it back over to Sarah. All right, take it away, Sarah. Awesome, thank you, Matt. So shifting just a little bit. So the last few slides, we showed you specific programs under specific agencies. This slide, the programs, they're all grant funding programs. The programs are lumped together here because they support community resilience. So in relation to economic mobility, if you have a big storm and people can't get to their jobs, that really hinders economic mobility. Kids or families can't get to their educational institution. That can impact communities. There's a number of things and ways we wanna support communities, not just in the day to day, but also to prepare for major events that might happen. So this first category is the USDA Community Wildfire Defense Program. The USDA typically breaks this program out into different regional programs. So there will be an East or Northeast regional application, a South region, a Western region, they'll break them out that way. Um, and these are for both plans to prepare for wildfires, but also specific projects to help mitigate the potential for wildfires. So think about brush clearing. And if you're in a big Western community, um, you want to make sure there's no brush there so things don't catch fire easily. So there's a lot of money in that program. The next program is the Department of Energy Build a Better Grid Initiative. So this is to really make the nations, more specifically, they want you to look in your own community, but to make our energy grid more resilient, more sustainable. And they're really looking at with this program, also making sure those insular areas, those areas that might not be as well connected to the overall grid are supported and that they're, they're getting consistent levels of energy. So if you're in a really rural area, if you're up in rural Alaska, they wanna make sure you're also getting your energy needs met in addition to boosting and improving these maybe more well-connected grid systems. 
The next category of funding, I'm going to say these two together. So it's the FEMA Flood Mitigation Assistance and the FEMA BRIC programs. So BRIC stands for Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities, and flood mitigation is what it sounds like. So both of these programs are technically under the overarching program title that is Hazard Mitigation Grants under FEMA. These are longstanding grant programs. They might have had some name changes with different administrations, but the the goal of these programs is really focused on pre-disaster mitigation. So making sure that you're shoring up any issues you have before that major storm hits. If you have, for say for the flood mitigation assistance program that really focuses on properties, infrastructure within areas that fall under the national flood insurance program. So if you have buildings that are located in that floodplain, they're at risk if there's a huge storm surge a huge amount of water that comes down, they will target funding in those areas to mitigate the problem. So you might sell the land and find a new place. You might raise the property up on stilts if it's in like a waterway area. Um, if you have a community-wide storm system, and Matt is working on one in West Virginia right now, has a large flood wall. That flood wall is aging and there's a large chance that if a hundred year storm hits, it could fall down, it could not fully fall down, but it could stop working properly and then the community gets flooded. So that's really what the focus of the flood mitigation assistance program is. Where the BRIC program is more wide ranging in the types of hazards it will address. So it could be flooding, could be hurricanes, it could be wildfires, it could be tornadoes or probably less likely, but a volcanic eruption. And the nice thing is too, they have also integrated cybersecurity as one of these pre-disaster ca pre disaster categories. So not natural disaster, but still a potential disaster that can completely disrupt, disrupt community operations. Someone hacks your locality's system um, that really disrupts all services in the community. It's not just one small issue. So that has also been incorporated into the FEMA BRIC program. The next category of funding is the HUD weatherization program. So this is more targeting specific people's homes. So apartment buildings, uh, single family houses, it helps them purchase the types of equipment improvements they need to protect their homes in the event of these major natural hazard events or weather events. So different types of funding for that. So new windows, new roof, retrofitting, things to make sure that they're prepared in the event of a large storm. And the last category, again, one of the newer programs is FEMA cybersecurity programs. So cybersecurity is becoming more and more of a risk that communities are starting to realize are could very much impact them. And um, they're starting to plan for that. How do we make sure we are protecting our community from these cybersecurity risks to make sure that we have continuity of operations in times of major disasters, but also in general. You wanna make sure the services you're providing in the community are consistent. And that's what ensures that you have a thriving community. You They consistently have access to these tools. They have the built environment that supports their needs. So these are just a couple of the examples of the resilience focused programs that are out on the street. Then I'm gonna switch. So under that interagency technical assistance program framework, the thriving communities framework, you'll see that a lot of these different agencies have set up their own technical assistance centers, programs, tools to help communities who are interested have the capacity to apply for the various sources of funding within their agency. So we talked about EPA Tic Tacs. There are also HUD and it's kind of a dual partnership between HUD and DOT, the Thriving Communities Technical Assistance Program. The name sounds familiar, I know. Then the DOE has some also really helpful technical assistance programs for communities that are looking to improve their energy system and become cleaner communities, reduce their greenhouse gas emission, emissions, um, and look at their, their energy network more holistically. Then within the EPA, there is also a technical assistance program specifically for all those water funds that we had highlighted on an earlier slide. So if you need help with a water specific project, uh, you can go to the EPA for technical assistance. Uh, they can help you with feasibility planning, uh, feasibility studies, H&H &H studies, 
that initial planning work to get you really geared up to go for these big monies. The USDA has a really awesome new rural partners network. If you're interested or you're a rural community, they actually have their own website. It's rural.gov now. That is specifically to support the rural communities that might need more assistance because of lack of capacity or access to these different resources. Then there's EDA funding. So if we want to look more specifically at economic mobility and ensuring people have the means that they need to secure a good job, the EDA is a great source of funding for that. They have the EDA Economic Recovery Corp, which is to help not only get people working by being part of the core, but also be boots on the ground in localities to help improve the infrastructure and the ecosystem to support a strong workforce. Um, the DOE Clean Energy to Communities program is similar to the Clean Cities Technical Assistance Program, but that's looking more generally overarching. So larger planning initiatives would be under the Clean Energy to the Community Program. And then DOE also has a National Community Solar Program, which as it sounds, it's focused on deployment of solar. Uh, as part of the IRA or the Inflation Reduction Act, the Biden administration established a number of different incentive type programs, as well as grant programs to push solar and other renewable energies forward. Um, so this type of technical assistance can help you look at, can your community support all the solar? Do you have the space? Do you get enough sun with your municipal buildings? But also, how do you plug in and incorporate the different types of funding into a project to make it a success, to make sure you have all the funds you need? So those incentive programs and different partnerships like that, they can connect you with those types of things. And with that, we are going to switch over just slightly. So this is not federal funding, but it's something we want you to remember and take away from this is that state funding is absolutely critical. Even with some of these programs waiving match requirements altogether or lowering match requirements, if you're going for a $50 million grant, most of the time they want to see some other skin in the game. Even if they say the match is waived, it will make your application look so much stronger if you can show that you have these partnerships in place. You have other funders coming in to support the project. And state funding is great for this in that state funding can be used to match federal grant programs. So a lot of federal grant programs might have a 20% match. You have a million dollar request that's $200,000 that your community might not have, but you can request funds from your state to support that match requirement. It's a very important source of funding that a lot of people may tend to overlook. Um, the nice thing about state funding also is it tends to be a bit less competitive because there are just less communities in your one state than there are communities in the entire country. So in terms of competitiveness, you might be more competitive for state funding to get you started and then can chase those big dollar amounts. Um, so they're similar to federal agencies. A lot of state governments have sub agencies that fund these different types of projects. So you can plug in where you need economic development, infrastructure, transportation, resilience, community service type organizations. They're all there. So there's a number of different buckets of funding you can look to, to get additional funds plugged in your project. One thing I do wanna note, um, like the TAP grant Matt had mentioned, the Transportation Alternatives Grant, just be wary because that is technically federal funding. So that's federal funding that flows to states who then administer the funds to localities. In instances like that, you cannot use that funding as match for another federal program. So just kind of be aware or try and stay aware of where that source of funding is originating because that's technically federal funds. You cannot use that to match other federal programs. And the nice part of this is well, not just state funding, but your state politicians, your state administrators are huge people to have as advocates on your side or to have as partners in your project. You want to get elected officials involved from your state level um, in the project. It's absolutely critical to have strong partnerships at all different levels um, when putting these projects together to make sure we are actually supporting that economic mobility function and that we have just in good governance. There is that collaborative nature 
we have diverse perspectives coming into the project while it's still in those early stages of development. So you can make sure it's reaching those goals that you have laid out for the, whatever project it is you're working on. And I think, okay, Matt, I think we're switching over to you. Sounds good. And uh, to my uh, my friends at ICMA, I think we have 35 minutes. So we're going to try to round the corner and we're going to round the corner to a different subject. We just told you about, I don't know, 50 different grants and each one of them are uh, are a lot. And so we have a uh, approach that we use with each of our clients and what we try to put out to people like you about how do you get organized? So I'd ask you if you wanted, you know, I'm looking at my friend, uh, Laura from ICMA, she lives up in Michigan. You know, do you think the Wolverines got ready to win that uh, bowl, you know, starting a month ahead of time? No. Do you think the Detroit Lions, who she's also a fan of, started figuring out their roster or their plays the week before they, you know, got into the playoffs? No. You've got to work ahead of time to identify what are our high priority projects? What is it going to take to get them done? How much funding have we leveraged? How much funding do we need to be able to get to the next critical stage of development? Who's behind us? Who do we need to get behind us? Um, what are the grants that are out there that we can match our needs to our grants? And how do we go about getting ready for those grants? Because if you do what a lot of us do, which is a grant comes out, it's due in 60 days. You don't really read it until it's due in 50 days. And then you got to go talk to your boss, the city manager or the mayor, and it's now it's doing 42 days. And then you're like, oh, my gosh, I need a million dollar match to be able to get this five million dollar grant. Can I even get it on the agenda for the council to be able to approve the million dollar match? Where are we going to get that million dollar match? Oh, forget it. We're not going to go for it until next year. That'd be no way to win a bowl game. It'd be no way uh, to win a big grant. And so. We're going to give you six tips for getting organized. I'll tell you that um, we have uh, uh, done webinars with ICMA and others that are just focused on these six tips. And so we have expanded versions of these uh, if anybody wants to get a hold of us. So the next slide, Sarah, tip number one is, um, okay, let's go ahead and bring all these out, Sarah. Okay. So, so um, you need to get ready for the big game. The big game might be a big highway project, a big economic revitalization project. You got a dead steel mill on your river and you want to turn it into something better. I mean, all of that is going to take a strategy where you convene a task force. Who do we need to be on this river front uh, revitalization project? Well, the Corps of Engineers is going to be involved. Let's call the district. And um, the economic development director is going to be involved and the neighborhood captain from the neighborhood that's decided will be involved and the developer who wants to redevelop that old site will be involved. I could go on and on. Um, the public works director needs to be involved. Get those people together and map out a strategy. Make sure you have support from your elected council uh, or your mayor or county administrator uh, that you have backing that you can pursue this and get somebody to be in charge of it, Right. Don't say, well, we got a committee of 12 people working on this. Surely this will get done. Find somebody who's going to be the leader of that project. That's common sense, but it really matters. Then uh, don't wait until you've decided exactly what to do and go to the community. Engage community stakeholders, neighborhood stakeholders, uh, bu business groups, council members. Uh, you know, we're talking about equity and inclusion and economic mobility. Don't reach out to the traditional folks and ignore uh, what might be the economically distressed or 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 uh, uh, or public housing residents or others that also have a stake in the outcome, but might not be as vocal or as uh, able to be um, engaged without you reaching out to them. So engage your community early because you're going to need to prove that engagement as effective when you're writing the big grant. Um, now, this is so important. Uh, I once sat down with a mayor who said, I've got 30 ideas of what I want to get done. And I said, pick three and focus on those. Now, every municipal manager has to do 30 things at one time. But when you're going for the big grants, you really need to figure out what are the next three things that are either critical needs, you know, things 
left undone that are really hurting us um, or would be transformational or have the best backing. Let's pick some priorities. Now, I say three. It could be two. It could be five. But but um, no city manager is really able to pursue 30 grants for 30 big priority projects at the same time. So identify your priority projects. And then I'll tell you another story. I once said to somebody, this big revitalization of that dead chemical plant on the river uh, with your idea, what is your, your economic development center going to cost? It might be 3 million. It might be 30 million. I said, buddy, you're not ready to go for this. You need to break down that project into bite-sized pieces. Is a riverfront revitalization project a, uh, a waterfront project? Yes. Is it a stormwater management project? Yes. Is it a trail along the river? Is it a brownfield cleanup? Is it a right-of-way acquisition? Is it a economic development project? Is it a public park on the river? It could be all those things. Every one of those things have different agencies, programs, and funding sources to do them. So break it down into the pieces of the project that's there, and then break it down into the phases of that. Everything has a phase. There's initial visioning and concept planning that moves into preliminary design, that moves into later stages of design, that may lead into site acquisition, may lead into demolition. Um, you may have to clean up contamination. Eventually, you get to construction. Sometimes construction is all one project. Sometimes it can be phased over multiple phases over time. All of those phases could be funded by different agency funds. And if you don't break down the components of the project and the phases of those components, you're not able to match that project up to the available funding sources. And that's what you want to do next is say, OK, we know what we want to do on this waterfront uh, revitalization. We want to create a public park a public trail, an econo uh, economic development uh, you know, incubator, and we're going to reserve this acreage over here for a developer who's going to build you know, housing, mixed income housing. Um, those are all different funding sources. There's all different components and stages of those. What are the three, four, five you know, dozen grants that would best match those funding sources? So I told you earlier on about different sources of funding where you can go and find funding. If you just open up the funding book and start tooling around and you don't really know what your project is about, if you don't have a task force of the right people together, an engaged community, priorities for where you want to focus, and a breakdown of what your project's all about, you're not going to be able to figure out what your grant opportunities are. So you really need to do all this before you ever go after a grant, right? So that's an annual funding strategy. And then when you really do those things, next slide, please, uh, Sarah. When you do those things, um, there are some tools that we always use and we would highly um, uh, uh, encourage you to do this for any particular project. It's gonna be a daycare center, it's gonna be a new city hall, it's gonna be a, uh, you know, a new pedestrian bridge over the highway, it's gonna be a riverfront revitalization get cost estimation, either hire cost estimators or hire an engineering firm or get somebody in-house if you have the capacity to figure out the sources and uses, particularly the uses, the cost breakdown of what's there. You can then bite off bite-sized pieces of that or be able to put that kind of budget detail into a grant application because you're going to be asked for it. And if you're like, I don't know, it's like a $10 million project. I don't know what it's made up of. You're not really ready to go for this. And you can't do that at the last minute. You have to do that months ahead of time before you apply for the grant. So get cost estimation. The second tool is a resource roadmap. We don't have time to go into resource roadmapping. We've done uh, whole webinars on just resource roadmapping, but it's basically those priorities that you identified for your community. We want to do a new police station, a new pedestrian bridge, a new daycare center, and a new waterfront revitalization down at the dead steel mill. You identify your priorities. You match them to the funding sources from some of the sources we've told you about. And you really come up with a step-by-step. -step. 
we need $500,000 of design and engineering money before we're ready to get cost estimation and construction. Our next grant is going to be um, a planning grant because they will give $500,000 grants. We have to put 20% in. So we're going to go to the city hall, uh, you know, to the council and get a hundred thousand dollar match, or we're going to get it from the local community foundation, or we're going to talk to the governor's office or a cabinet secretary in the state about getting that hundred thousand. We know that will get us to the next stage of being ready for that project. Cause we'll have a shovel ready design ready project. So a resource roadmap, we do them. They're 20 to 50 pages depending on the number of projects you have them, they lay out step-by-step what we want to do. And then your municipal team, your elected officials know what we're aiming at. And when you see your member of Congress, you can say, you know, the three grants we're going for in the next six months, we know what they are. We've got a plan. And they're like, you got your act together. You're the type of community I want to uh, to support when I'm advocating for these things. Um, so that's a resource roadmap. A lot more resources on resource roadmaps that we can get you And then the last thing is everybody goes to conferences, they bring their business card and you hand out a bunch of business cards. Um, You know, here are the ones I got at the last conference that I haven't even organized yet. I haven't even really looked at them, right? That's what they're doing with your business card. But if you have a one page piece of paper, no staples, it can be front and back that says, here's our project. This is in Norfolk, Virginia, a $54 million park that is also a community resilience project I'll tell you more about. This sheet tells why it's important, why it's needed, who's behind it, what's been done. When you turn it over, you can't turn it over uh, virtually here, but it lists the exact grants that we want for that project. When you bump into your governor's chief of staff or your congressional state director or the reporter, in your town or a city council member who wants to know more about it, you say, read this one page, you'll know what this project is about and what we're going for and how you have to help us. So get your cost estimations, do a resource roadmap and develop a briefing sheet for each significant project. That should be your calling card when you're going around looking for money. All right. This is you, Sarah. Oh, I thought this one was yours, but I'll do this one. That's fine. All right, so as we have discussed, I'm just going to pull each of these up now. Wait. I'll go ahead and go. Okay, it's frozen. Okay, so so if you have a resource roadmap, then you know what your match is going to be. If you have cost estimation, you know it's a million dollar project. I need a I need a twenty percent match or a fifty percent match. I need two hundred thousand. I need five hundred thousand dollars. If you wait to the last minute. You're going to have a hard time with the cost share. I met one city. I'm not going to name them. And the mayor looked at me and says, we have all the money we need. We don't need any grants. We are so flush with money. We can do whatever we want. We have a hard time finding projects. And I said, good for you, mayor. Um, That's the only mayor I've met in 30 years who has said anything like that. Most folks need to think ahead of time with budgets and capital plans and uh, and decision making about where you're going to put your match money. So, match is critical for those programs that don't have waived matches. Um, you can go to a governor or a a, a a state senator or a or a cabinet secretary or a philanthropy and say, "I'm going to need two hundred thousand dollars to do this. Pledge it to me, even if you don't give it to me unless I win the other four hundred thousand or the other eight hundred thousand you know, it's contingent on us winning that grant, right? Can I put a letter from your foundation into the application packet? Um, You can make matches for most programs with in-kind resources. That's easier to do when you got to put in $50,000 of in-kind against a $200,000 grant. It's tougher when you got a $20 million infrastructure project. You're not going to make a 20% match with uh, staff time and you know, and 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 uh, using uh, the pens from the office, um, but some you can use in-kind resources. Um, get that budget ready before you. Uh, I mean, when we are talking to people about a grant coming up, we say, "What's your project?" And we talk about it, and we kind of shape it to match the funding source. And then we say, "Give us a budget before we even start working on on the application and the advocacy," because. The budget tells you what the project's really about. 
And then particularly for large projects, you might have to borrow a HUD Section 108 loan, borrow a USDA loan, borrow a federal home loan bank uh, loan, um, um, uh, borrow through bonding. Your capacity to handle that debt, your political capacity to get your governing body to agree to that debt, your capacity to know that you've worked with bond counsel or other financial experts to figure out how you're going to repay those cannot be figured out in a few weeks. It takes time. So if you're going to go for big money and you know what the match is, the cost is going to be, you know what match you have to bring in, go ask your governor for that money. I'm turning in a FEMA brick today for $28 million with a $9 million match. It is the poorest city in West Virginia, which is the third poorest state in America. And we're asking the governor to cover that $9 million match. But we also have a letter from bond council stapled to a letter from the mayor saying, we'll bond it if we have to, because we don't want that flood wall to fail. So uh, all of that takes time. This plan for cost sharing is as critical as anything else. Okay, back to you, Sarah. All right. So I'm on to tip four, and this is proactively approaching grant writing. So grant writing, especially you go, you're like, okay, we're going to apply for this grant. You open the notice of funding opportunity or the notice of funding announcement, and then you see all of the requirements that are listed there. And there are usually a lot. Um, and there's a lot to slog through, but almost every grant application has at least one section of narrative. So a written explanation of the who, the why, the what, and the how that is the basis for your grant. So first is telling a story. You want to paint a picture for the reviewers of your locality specifically, your project specifically. What are the events that might have happened to get you to the point that you need this grant? Or on the flip side, what is your vision? What are you looking to do? Where are you looking to go? And how do those things interplay? Um, those things all help you get ready for grant writing and they're just good practice as a part of it, the entire ecosystem of grants. So you should have these kind of ideas in your head already, um, maybe not super project specific. But when I said get ready for the grant writing portion, get a grant writer ready for it, they need to have this material available to them. And that might just be a treasure trove of all of this data you collected from those data tools we showed you earlier that you just have ready to go, primed to go, so you can plug them into the application where needed. This is also making sure that they have all of the tools that they need to be effective. So having that project budget, if the person writing the application is not the one putting the budget together, they need to talk to each other. They need to understand what the specific scope of work is so they can write that down in the narrative and not raise red flags for reviewers. They just read an entire application and have absolutely no idea what you're actually gonna use the money for. Make sure your project is either shovel ready or shovel worthy. And that feeds into having that task force in place, doing that public engagement, having those partnerships, having the match in place. So your project might not be at the point where it's 100% shovel ready, you have design bid documents ready to go, you're ready to put out the RFP for construction, but it should be shovel worthy. They should be able to understand the vision and your goals and what's going on and know that you are started the steps to get you to a place that would make you shovel ready. They have a strong inclination that you have done the due diligence you need to do to get you to where you want to go with the funds you are requesting. And this part of that due diligence process is zoning requirements, permitting, approvals. So in almost every grant application, especially for physical construction type projects, they're going to ask you questions within this narrative response about zoning, more, more likely about permitting and approvals. Zoning might be a part of it if you're doing a, a mixed use development type project or different things like that. But permitting and approvals, if you're doing a construction project, are almost always assured. So these processes take a while. You might not have, have them completed by the time of the application, but they want to know you're thinking about it. You know who you need to go to to get those permits and approvals. You need to know the timeline it's going to take to get those things done. You might want to have started conversation with the relevant 
individuals who work on these. So if I'm in my state and I'm working on, let me think of a good project, like a brownfield project, I might want to go to my state uh, Department of Environmental Protection and have those conversations. So maybe if it's a brownfield, it needs to be entered into the state program. There's different things that you need to consider prior to submitting this application. Um, the important thing to know is that there is some nuance around this. So you don't have to have all these things 100% ready to go by the time you submit your application. But you need to show the reviewers that you have thought about it and plan for it and are ready to do it when the time comes. So that's the shovel worthiness, not, not necessarily shovel ready, but shovel worthy and managing and removing risks. So there's always risks to these projects. You're asking for $20 million. There's going to be risks involved there. These risks might vary. They could be natural hazard type risks. They can be economic risks. They can be risks related to finding a contractor to do this work or finding the materials you need to actually put in what you're looking to put in. So making sure those are available. We know we've seen over the past few years following the pandemic, increasing in pricing. So those types of risks. What happens if the project comes way over budget because you anticipated an amount and then you put it out to bid and the bids come back 20, 30% higher than what you had planned for. You don't have enough money for that. So having an understanding and an assessment of these risks going in is critical. And planning for sustainability is also a component of this. So back on maybe two slides ago, under construction, there was a little sub bullet for O&M or operation and management. That is part of the sustainability. They're going to give you $10 million. I'm just going to make up a number to put in a bridge in your community. They want to know that you have the capacity and the plans in place to maintain that infrastructure. You are properly maintaining the investment that they are supporting. They want to know you have that in place. And this sustainability is also maybe more continuity. If it's a programming request, maybe not an infrastructure project, they want to see that you have the means in place to continue that program or learn from that grant funded piece. And how you plan to take that moving forward? What are you going to do with the information that you might have gotten? Do you just establish a pilot program with this project? Are you going to secure additional sources to move this project forward? Are you going to review the results? and maybe create a new program. These are all things you need to think about. So as we look into the future on those time horizons, planning ahead is critical. And then there is always the chance that you will not receive the grant. And the first time you write it or from that agency or your project might not fit well, but getting you prepared for that next round of funding is also super critical. So I would submit a grant. I might not have won. It sucks. I know. I don't like it. But you should continue those touches with those agencies. Request more information about why your project didn't win. A lot of these agencies will provide debriefs in that most of these agencies have structures in place. There is a review panel that goes through your application and scores the projects based on the established scoring criteria. They have their notes available. They're usually submitted along with their review information. So they do it differently. So I don't want to get to do much information, but they will provide you this information in that someone will sit down with you and say, this is what the reviewer said. They'd like this. You scored highly on this, but maybe you need to work on this portion. Um, so keep that in mind. So even if you don't get it the first time, there are ways that you can improve moving forward and it's continuing those touches with those agencies. And then I'm going to go a little quicker through these because I know we're running out of time. Advocacy. Advocacy is so important. Be a champion for your projects, especially if they're priorities for you and your administration. Get backings from your local officials, so the mayor, your council members, key stakeholders who might directly be impacted, so those maybe community nonprofits or service organizations, maybe it's your local environmental group or your neighborhood association. Get backing from the state, and again, that could be financial backing um, or support or it can be more general support. They can be advocates for your projects. Um, we also strongly encourage communities to reach out to these agencies and these program officials, maybe before the NOFO even opens or while well, the money is pending, reach out to them, learn more about the projects, get their nuanced opinion as people who are boots on the ground working on these types of 
funding projects. Um, have a conversation with them, schedule meetings. One of the few good things about the post-COVID world is a lot of people are also willing to have virtual meetings with you because we're all based all around the country. You don't have to fly to DC to get these meetings. They'll, they'll take virtual meetings with you, which is always super helpful. Same can be said with being in your district, working with your members of Congress and their staff. So you're two senators, maybe you have one, maybe you have two members of Congress, depending on how big your jurisdiction is. Work with those members directly, but also work with their staff who are responsible for these specific portfolio of issues. Work with them and it'll be so much easier when it's time to actually submit a grant um, to get letters of support from them. They already know what the project is. They're aware of it. They know where you stand. They'll be happy to advocate on your behalf. Um, not everyone wants to, but yes, plan a visit. Maybe plan a visit to D.C. or your regional headquarters or wherever your state government is located. Plan a visit and meet with these people. These partnerships, these connections you're building are so important, not just for this project, but maybe your larger vision. This might be one component of one of those huge type riverfront revitalization projects Matt was using as an example. Get them teed up, prepared, and aware of what's going on. And then the fun stuff is also invite funders to the site and project tours. If your project is already underway or different things, reach out to them. Um, have them come see it in person. It makes a huge difference. Or if you're doing an economic development type project or a more well-rounded project, maybe host a roundtable with all of these different funding, funding agencies who may be able to support the project and work with them. And... The fun part is celebrating success. So if you do receive funding or if you reach a milestone in the project, put the word out, reach out to people, thank them, let them know, host a ribbon cutting, host a groundbreaking. We always say success breeds success. People love to be involved in things that they think are gonna be successful. They love it, they want to be a part of it. Um, be proactive with your communications. Thank those funding agencies that might have given you funding. Reach out to them on social media. Post about it. Make it well known. Um, send direct thank you letters to these agencies or the members who might have supported or actively supported your application to get you that fund. Um, and then last, thank your funders in a public setting. This will help build confidence, gratitude, and build momentum for those future projects that you might have. You're, you're moving forward. Success breeds success. Everyone wants to be with the winners. So yeah. I'm going to now shift it over to Matt. And again, I'm sorry. I know we're running out of time. Okay, great. Um, I was trying to send a note to my ICMA colleagues and I sent it to everybody that we don't have time to do the case study. If you can bring the pictures out, um, yes. uh, Sarah, I would just say that um there's an area off of downtown Norfolk that was built over 300 years on an estuary off the Chesapeake Bay. Water has memory. They put all the public housing there. They buried all the contaminated waste there. And then they put in uh, 1,800 public housing units, 97% poverty, 99% African-American, they built a system of highways around it that cut them off from the rest of the community. It was not a thriving community and the economic mobility was at near zero. And now Norfolk, uh, led by a, a visionary mayor, good staff, and a lot of community stakeholders have raised $500 million in all the kinds of grants that we're talking about by putting together a resource roadmap getting community engagement, working with their uh, uh, with their state and federal officials. Um, we could tell you uh, they are now going to be doing, um, it's called the St. Paul's Neighborhood. They call it the St. Paul's Transformation. In the top left corner, that's built with HUD Choice Neighborhood and USDOT raise grants. On the top right-hand corner, that is where the water used to go and flood people out. It's now going to be a $54 million grand park. We've got um, uh, National Park Service Outdoor Recreation Legacy Partnership. We've got um, U.S. Forest Service green infrastructure money. We've got U.S. EPA brownfield money. It's a great success story. 
Check it out. Norfolk's St. Paul's Transformation. And if we go to the last slide, Sarah. Yep. And one thing I will say is the video we have here, it's a minute and a half. So not too big of an investment. But if you'd like to look, we strongly encourage you to do so. So we know we don't have a lot of time for questions, but uh, we will take questions and answers. We're going to do an FAQ document for any of the of the questions in the chat that we were not able to answer. Um, Sarah came up with really hilarious uh, memes and uh, and uh, and uh, relevant uh, cartoons here. Um, contact ICMA or contact Sustainable Strategies if you want to talk about this more. I'm going to turn it over to our partner Laura uh, to close this out. Sounds good. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Sarah. This was a, a lot, a tremendous amount of information. And as you noted, we could do a deeper dive on a number of different components. So um, first, number one question, of course, is where do we get access to these slides since there's a lot of information for reference? So the learning, the ICMA Learning Lab, the online, you know, the website where you came to access the Zoom link for this, there's a tab there uh, titled Additional Resources. The slides are available there. Um, and and it's, if there are the FAQ or any other um, follow-up information we develop, we'll post there as well. Um, I, as I think I appreciate that you've been able to address a lot of the very tactical questions as we went along in the chat. If people have, I see a few other ones trickling in. We probably won't dig into those now in our um, you know dwindling minutes. But if you want to throw a question at the wall and we can see if we can get an answer in that follow-up communication, please feel free. A quick question there about um, any hints on when the FY. 24 appropriations bill will be passed? Yeah, I was just typing this out. Uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, 30 years doing this, I have a very high degree of confidence that this will get done. It uh, And we will not get a year-long continuing resolution, which is bad for a lot of federal agencies and a lot of people in America. And all of you who are lining up for what will be around 16,000 different earmarks that are in those bills, it would be very bad for you because they would disappear instantly if we had a year-long CR. Um, I am highly confident uh, that we're going to do it. In fact, last week, I bet Sarah Marin $1 trillion that we would get the FY24 budget. She did not take the bet, but somebody's going to get a lunch out of this. And all of you hope it is me. Um, March 9th. March 9th. Um, uh, they have a deal on the number. They have to flow it into 2,500 pages of legislation. Um, I do believe that, well, the Senate will get it all done. The Senate is passing these things unanimously. I do believe that House Speaker Mike Johnson will stick to the deal. I do believe that he's going to have to get Democrats to vote for it. And I do believe there's a real question about whether he makes it past that vote. But I bet we get to that vote. So that's my answer. All right. Okay, and, thanks. Oh, and to um, fill in the blanks here, so presently the deadlines to get these done are February 18th or January 19th and February 2nd. They are currently working to punt those deadlines back to March 1 and March 8th. So those are the deadlines we are now looking at. That's our horizon for the new. All right, sounds good. Um, I just want to do like two or three lightning round true or false questions for, for both of you. Um, so I think you've covered these, but true or false, um, you mentioned that there are some programs that are funneling through the states, but true or false, there are a number of programs in the bipartisan infrastructure law, for example, that localities can access directly. True. More than ever, true. Yep. Okay. True or false, um, the definition of disadvantaged community sometimes relates to the whole jurisdiction and sometimes relates to a targeted uh, geographic segment. True. And some of those who put in the questions that I don't think our community will qualify, I bet you have neighborhoods that will qualify. Focus the grants there. Yeah. Look at the okay. census tracks first. Okay. And last yeah. one, true or false? Infrastructure can refer to kind of the traditional public works, roads, that type of thing, as well as equipment, other types of capital. False. Yeah. False. Okay. There's funding for all of that, but they're normally not infrastructure bills. They're normally other kind of grant programs. Okay, excellent. So we've got, we're down to our last minute. So um, there were some process questions about accessing your newsletter and um, some guidance on using Candid. I think we can follow up with um, that next communication on those. Um, 
And I, you will also, attendees will get access to a survey um, to provide your feedback on this presentation. Feel free to use that to also tell us where you'd like to see future webinars or other deep dives on different components of this. So I just, again, want to thank you both. This is dense um, and appreciate you keeping it to a manageable, you know, 90 minutes or so today. And to close us out, I will um, just hand it over to Julian. And with that, we must conclude today's webinar. A special thank you to our presenters and to everyone who joined us today, and we hope we'll see you again soon. Please take a moment to complete a brief evaluation of today's program by returning to the ICMA Learning Lab page where you logged in today. The survey must be completed to unlock your certificate for this program. After completing the survey, you can access your certificate via the Achievements tab at the top of the interface. A recording of today's session will be uploaded to the same place you found the Zoom link in the Learning Lab, along with the slide deck that can be found under the Additional References tab. Today's program is copyright 2024 by the International City County Management Association with all rights reserved. This concludes today's program. You may now disconnect.